All right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our February webinar, Women in Conservation Part Two. And my name is Christy Foster. I'm head of engagement here at Conservation Careers. Um, and last year, about actually the same time in February, we ran Women in Conservation Part One. And it was one of our, actually, it was the most popular webinar we've done on conservation careers to date. We had, a, I think, 1,300 people sign up. Um, and we enjoyed the discussion in the chat so much that we decided we wanted to come back and do it again um, about a year later. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be here hosting with three very special guests joining us. We'll introduce in a second. Um, and just for a bit of context, so at Conservation Careers, we help about 700,000 conservationists around the world each year. Uh, and I just looked at our analytics again today and about 60.5% of those conservationists based on our website stats are women. Um, so it's the majority of, of our audience that we're helping at Conservation Careers and, and probably fairly representative of the sector. Um, so these are you know, motivated, passionate, talented women who are, are here to help wildlife um, and we're going to talk about today some of the some of the issues that they might face and some of the opportunities too. Um, so thank you to everyone who's joining, all the women who are joining, perhaps also men who are joining today, um, for being here. It would be fantastic if um, you're attending, if you can just put your your country or your region into the chat, so we have kind kind of an idea of where you're joining from and who's with us. That would be really great. Um, and basically what we've done is we looked at what kind of topics were popular last year when we ran the webinar, what kind of questions we've gotten since then, and we're really going to try and focus in on, on popular topics um, that we hope might, might help you and be of interest, which are imposter syndrome and self-sabotage, uh, perfectionism, and then lastly, how to balance you know, the professional life, your career with personal life. Um, and at the end, we'll have we'll have a Q and A, and we'll share some resources too. Great, really nice to see. We've got um, people joining from the UK, Brazil, myself included, um, Canada. Deb, nice to see you there. Claire Roberts, nice to see you. Um, US, Italy, Scotland, Germany, Wales. Nice. Belgium, Egypt. Spain, fantastic, a whole mix. It's really nice to have everyone here. Um, and we're gonna get you guys to interact soon in a bit. Okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome three fantastic guests today. Um, so we have here Laura Cuppage and Kirsty Crawford from And Another Thing, which is basically an honest space for conservation issues. So these lovely ladies um, have been supporting networking and workshops and discussions and, and much more around conservation issues. Um, and also, I, I guess, around personal development related to, to environmental careers more broadly. Um, I'm also excited to welcome a third guest this year, um, who is Sevim Yildiz. Um, and Sev has actually recently worked with the BBC on um, the children's book, for Seven Worlds, One Planet. Uh, and she's a British Turkish TV researcher among many other talents that I think you'll hear about shortly. Uh, so a really warm welcome to the three of you. And I'd love it if you could just introduce yourselves uh, just briefly. Kirsty, do you wanna do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. So my name is Kirsty. I'm talking to you from Glasgow in Scotland in the UK. I am the Community Engagement and Volunteer Manager for the Marine Conservation Society, so a UK marine charity, but my background is in journalism and also performing arts, where I used to live in London and I was a professional performer, so I had a total career switch, which was fraught with self-doubt in the beginning, coming from being a stage performer to a conservationist. I studied and got my Masters in Wildlife Ecology. And I found myself here today talking to you and then Laura and I in the summer of 2020 set up our platform um, due to sort of a lack or a want from both of us for a platform just like that where you can be your honest and true self while discussion discussing professional and personal issues relating to conservation so that's and another thing and that's our little passion project that we'll talk more to you about thank you thanks Christy 
maybe I can pass over to you, Laura. Yeah, sure. Um, so my, my name's Laura, I'm the second half of And Another Thing. Um, my background actually in textiles and fashion. Um, I'm currently an artist based in North London and I specialise in drawing animals and working with conservation charities. Um, I'm an artist at a organisation called Wildlife Drawing and we work with conservation and wildlife programs all over the world and we use art as a way to engage and talk to people about uh, conservation and wildlife in the hope that it educates them and hopefully allows people to want to help and know what's going on out there in the world. Um, all of the conservation programs that we work with and organisations, we donate a, um, a percentage of the, the profit from each se uh, session. So coming from a slightly different background again from Kirsty, um, and I do it part time. So I, I like to think I'm a conservationist, but I also like to think that you can be a conservationist for whatever you're doing, depending on your passion, and it doesn't have to be your career. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Laura. And I think there's huge, just huge potential for art to play a role in communicating and, and engaging people in conservation. That's amazing. All right, Seth, over to you. Sure. Hi, everybody. I hope everyone's safe wherever you are on the world. Uh, I'm Sevim. I'm a TV researcher currently working at BBC Earth on the children's box of Seven Worlds on Planet. I am of Turkish background, but I do tend to take the Turkish side more. But apart from that, I, uh, I started actually in animals. It was very, very young, very young age. And I went to college, did an animal management course there, did my BA in university, followed by an MA as well and graduated two years ago. Apart from that, I am a podcast producer of Be Curious Beans podcast, where I connect people of all ages, different cultures to nature and get them curious about all the little things that we may be missing on a daily basis. And that is just to spread some joy, some curiosity, and hopefully some education and awareness along the way. And that's practically me. <laughs> Fantastic. It's amazing to have the three of you from such diverse different backgrounds and experiences and careers here today. Um, so thank you for being here. And we're, I wanna get right into our discussion because uh, there's lots to talk about. Um, but I do wanna say first that, um, just to acknowledge that of course we, we are not able to and not trying to cover all of the complex issues that women in conservation can face um, in today's discussion. Um, but we are here to, to share some of some of your experiences and insights and, and learnings and hopefully that'll spark you know more discussion and more insights for those on the call so all right um we are going to have a q a at the end after this discussion so if you're listening in and you have a question um for anyone here please put it into the q a box rather than into the chat and that just means that other people can vote for your question also and it's more likely we'll answer the the most popular questions. So put it in the Q&A box, please, if you just think of something as we're going through. Um, okay, so first question today to start off is, what is imposter syndrome and what is self-sabotage? Um, I don't know, if, Christy, do you wanna start off on that one? Yeah, thank you very much. I know this came up quite a lot last year when we had this session. Um, and we wanted to dive into it a little bit more because it is quite nuanced. So um, effectively, imposter syndrome is this persistent inability to believe that your success is legitimately achieved or deserved. So this constant feeling of, of being an intruder in your own field and that you might be going to get found out at any minute and it, what you have achieved might be taken away from you. So I suppose a little bit of anxiety built into that as well. Um, but we do want to acknowledge, and I know resources will be going out after this webinar, a really great article in the um, Harvard Business Review, which is entitled Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. So it, it spread a whole new angle on it that imposter syndrome was basically lack of visibility packaged into this phrase imposter syndrome, when really it was a, a response to there being a lack of visible role models for women from various backgrounds and ages, ethnicities. Um, and that was leading to those feelings of so-called imposter syndrome. So there's two viewpoints there, and I know several touch on that kind of lack of visibility um, in a minute. But we have found through the And Another Thing platform, so we speak 
primarily it's women at our kind of workshops and sessions. They're really op open and, and honest forums to sort of air your views. And we found when speaking to women, they tend to, um, particularly in stages of applying for interview or getting through to interview, have that ability to sort of almost self-sabotage for themselves. So self-sabotage is a um, almost a symptom of imposter syndrome where those the negative self-talk and the doubts, you almost start to internalize them to the point that you end up sabotaging positive opportunities that come your way because you are um, feeling those effects of imposter syndrome. So we um, also tend to find that the kind of unhelpful narrative of job quotas in certain industries or um, trying to reach out to a female audience then could have that negative um, knock-on effect of well you only got the job because you were a woman and sort of that fill in the quota of gender specific roles could also have a knock-on effect so that's my take on imposter syndrome leading to self-sabotage and also one thing I wanted to say is it's quite significant um, research that it, it does tend to affect women more but also quite interesting I found was that when applying for a job men tend to stick to the, the top couple of bullet points, whereas women will fixate not even on the essential, but the desirable criteria. So we're almost micromanaging our own expectations of ourselves before even putting ourselves out there, rather than accepting that we are legitimately able to achieve our own success by our own means. But Sev, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add on the, any of that. Definitely, of course. And I I, I love the description, by the way. I I, I, believe, I honestly think coming from a very cultured background, it's been very prominent in my life, this whole imposter syndrome and self-sabotage that I have tend to I have told myself on countless countless occasions that I have that I'm not good enough and that I have to be this person in, in order to get somewhere. And luckily it's taking it's taking some time to get out of that. And and luckily, it's it's a nice kind of insight to have when you do kind of build your way out of it. But I, for sure, coming from a very cultured background is always one straight line. It was always you have to do this in order to get to here, to get to there. You can't you can't necessarily divert off this line. Otherwise, it's kind of represented as something completely different. But in my case, I was quite lucky in that regard. My my family are very very reassuring and very supportive of what I wanted to do and that was animals uh, I'm pretty sure that maybe a doctor or a dentist might have been something a little bit more better but they were extremely very positive about it and I think with with that many times within my career I'd, I'd come across very serious and very very strict on myself and that's where the imposter syndrome came from because that's not me and I kind of put myself in a position where I was having to be this person that I wasn't comfortable with, which then led on to self-sabotage. I was always, like I said previously, telling myself that I wasn't good enough and that I can't reach these goals and that, you know, a, a person like me can't possibly work for the BBC because this is this is too, ex too experienced. It's for people that have the experience. And I think going through all those kind of small stages of my life, it's kind of opened my eyes a little bit more and, and I've kind of discovered that, you know, coming from a very diverse background, everyone has their unique talents and unique insights that companies do kind of crave for. And speaking on behalf of, you know, cultured people, it's, it's something that we are very proud of that we can do and that we have this voice that we can talk about. And it's definitely something that everyone should try for sure is just to speak up and not have that kind of self-doubt and looking for reassurance because I did that quite a lot I always looked for reassurance you know reassurance from people like am I doing okay is this right is this correct and really doubting my own abilities of loving what I do and that's where it really kind of comes up to me as a person is to figure out what is important to me and figure out who I am as a person and conservation has done that and you lovely crew and everyone you know is such a supportive system that has allowed me to kind of take those small stages out of that kind of thought process I love thanks both both Christy for the overview and what you you found through and another thing and, and Seb for sharing your personal experience and I think that's something that's really positive there is that employers are looking for people from different 
backgrounds um, is one really positive thing. And we notice that too at conservation careers. Um, obviously that's just one aspect of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but also that conservation is a supportive community, you know, um, that's something we've been focusing a lot at lately too. And, and you realize that there's tons of other people out there who can share experiences that you can relate to and that can help you through your, you know, struggles or decisions or, or self doubts or whatever they may be. Um, so just recognizing that we're, we're part of that community, I think is really important. Yeah. All right. Um, I wanted to, actually, I just have a, a quick follow on question, which is, was there a moment for either any of you where you heard the word imposter syndrome or self-sabotage and went, ah, that's, that's what I do. I'm just curious. Mm all the time <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> all the time all the time uh, like, I, I connect with that more so and I know that's quite negative but I think just just everything that's happening really uh, in the world has kind of accumulated to that one moment where I think yeah that's exactly what I do and I kind of need to get out of that so yeah it's been happening for the beginning of my of my career and even now so it's definitely trying to figure out how to get out of that for sure. Yeah. I think for, for me, unfortunately, it wasn't until I left um, a previous job that I realized that it could have been more imposter syndrome than actually believing I wasn't meant to be there. And it took a lot of personal growth mm -hmm. and reflecting on what, where I wanted to go with my career that then allowed me to realize that it was, um, it was kind of my own negative thoughts that were, holding me back somewhat yeah which I guess in itself is kind of a positive you know if you go through one of those experiences and you're able to learn from it mm -hmm. um you can actually come out you know with a lot more sort of self-belief and confidence through that process hopefully I thanks so much I wanna, oh yeah sorry Christy no, I just I, I know we're really we're sticking to time I was just gonna say my yeah. imposter syndrome was almost handed to me I was feeling quite confident changing careers and on my first day at university on the master's course in groups we had to introduce ourselves and our background so what we had previously done and where we came from what we studied and what we hoped to gain from the course and my group and it was all boys men which doesn't you know that's by the by um I explained who I was and I didn't have a background in science and one of them um after I finished speaking just said no offense but why are you here um mm -hmm. And that was just quite, um, the imposter syndrome was just served to me on a plate then. So I had to work quite hard through university to, to sort of not let that get in my head and just believe. Yeah. 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 It's crazy to think what one, one comment mm -hmm. from someone who doesn't even know you, yeah. what effect that can have. Mm. I think it's quite equal. If I'm honest, I think anyone who's diverted from a different subject to now, I think it's beautiful. I think it's fantastic that you're having that moment where you want to change something and that's okay um so to have someone say that to you is quite harsh actually yeah it takes it takes a lot of courage to start something when you come come from a different exactly. you know, background or training or whatever it is so well i guess to lead into we're going to keep talking about um imposter sy syndrome and, and self-sabotage and to kind of lead into our next question I want to ask those of you on the call listening in um, a question also so I'm just going to launch it here so the question is if you've experienced imposter syndrome and or self-sabotage yourself what was it related to um, so there's a it's multiple choices a few options there um, so there's qualifications you know your education and training experience age background so it could be ethnicity or or socioeconomic background, family, family situation, gender identity, or, or other. Um, and if there's something we've missed in that list that you think should be there, feel free to pop that in the chat too. Um, so again, if you've ever experienced imposter syndrome and or self-sabotage, what was it related to? And I'll just give another moment there for everyone to, to complete. Well, that's interesting. I can see the results coming in just now. <laughs> <laughs> but I realize no one else on the call can see them yet. <laughs> I need a drum roll. Yes, <laughs> someone do it. Someone do it. 
<laughs> okay, I think that's I think that's everybody. So I'm going to just share the results so you can see them. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you can see that experience was came out quite strongly, followed by qualifications. And um, I think I'll just I'll leave those results up here so you can see as, as we move on to the next question. Um, and you know, you, can, you might find you want to refer to them too. So the next question is, what have, have the three of you learned about imposter syndrome? And what are your top tips um, for managing it? Because I um, doubt there's a way to just remove it entirely. It's more about managing it. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, take this one to start with, if you want. Sure. Um, so I feel like, again, going back to the idea of um, self-work and kind of stepping back and thinking what it was I was passionate about and looking into my values. Um, I think that maybe some of the experience I've had and possibly the fact that I'm quite an anxious person anyway, fed into imposter syndrome. And I think that's why maybe I suffered from it. Um, I saw that the second one on that poll was, um, was education. So when I went into conservation, um, I didn't have any qualifications. I was a presenter at London Zoo and constantly I was like, I don't know about these animals. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but then it started to shift when I started actually getting some therapy for my anxiety, which then was able to go into um, everyday life and my work life. And one of the top things I got from, from that was um, kind of answering that that voice back so if you get that little negative voice that says you can't do this you haven't got the qualifications you haven't done this blah 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 um kind of being like hey thanks for the warning but I'm gonna do it anyway um and we'll see what happens so kind of being more secure in that uncertainty and maybe you will some will say something like they did to Kirsty but if you have that that thought in your head that goes you know what I'm gonna do it anyway and we'll see what happens um so yeah talking back to the imposter syndrome but giving it giving it a little bit of like sympathy as well and looking at it as if as if it's just trying to protect you rather than seeing it as this like really mean horrible thing that's trying to disrupt your life is mm. being like oh it's just looking after me um almost make it into a bit of a um I don't know like this other entity that's that's help trying to help you out but mm. it's maybe not the help you need um, that really stuck with me and at first I thought I'm not sure about this but it really did help so once those negative thoughts were coming in I just was I just was able to say and it's hard I'm not saying it just happens overnight but you start to go yeah well we'll just try it anyway mm -hmm. the less power you give it the less it will hold you back so if you kind of ignore it or just go or acknowledge it and go okay um that's imposter syndrome kind of give it a name then that really helped me too. Um, and my second tip would be finding a community or finding a friend that you have the same issues mm. with um, and just talking, being open to people and talk about how you feel really, really helps because it means that you realise you're not alone. Mm. So are my top tips. <laughs> That's amazing advice. I, I love that about, you know, recognising and where that imposter syndrome is coming from kind of almost visualizing it as its own mm -hmm. entity mm -hmm. and, then, and then deciding what to do about that we did a great webinar um about a year ago that also talked about confidence and imposter syndrome but about how the brain works um and one of the things that came out of that webinar it's it's um you know asking yourself do i want to feel this way and, and then deciding yes or no reminds me of you know what you're saying reminds me of that uh, all right. Um, next tips. Kirsty, do you want to do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to kind of echo. So the first thing would be what Laura said about finding a community, which was the ethos, the reason for setting up our small platform and community. We were, we had each other, which is amazing, and we became friends. We bonded, and we thought, is there anybody else out there like us? There must be, surely, that wants more and wants authenticity and doesn't want to network in a, in a stuffy room and wants to find opportunities organically with other women. So um, finding a community, you can please come and be part of ours. We would love to have you. 
Um, and from that, we sort of try and build that women support and women ethos of, you know, that thing of may your, room, may your name be mentioned in a room full of opportunities today. Um, meeting people and boosting them up the way you would want to be boosted. Um, and we kind of chat about that thing of seeing a woman or, or a person in your dream role or a role that you're really trying to get to, or maybe the person that got the job that you didn't get, instead taking a step back from that lens of envy um, mm -hmm. and irritation of seeing that as a, through the lens of opportunity, which we've the three of us have spoken about and saying, okay, well, why and how and what can I learn from you? And maybe I'll check out your LinkedIn and I'll see if you're running a webinar and I'll sort of get in your circle and see how you operate and I can learn from you. And so when you drop the, the, the sort of um, envy and negativity, sometimes mm. it can lead to, um, it can open doors uh, in, a, in, a, in an easier way. Um, my second tip, um, I think is just, yeah, have an open and honest conversation, especially in the workplace about imposter syndrome if possible. And it sets a more human tone and it makes it seem more relatable because I'm pretty sure that everybody, almost everybody has felt it in some respect. Mm -hmm. And something that I used to do just to keep track of the small wins and successes and things to build my confidence and even to name check in, in, on an application or in an interview was like a little mini um, notebook or the notes app in my phone of like here's some cool things that happened today and they don't necessarily need to be massive successes of like winning funding bids just things that I made happen that I'm proud about because you forget you just forget by the end of the day pretty much but I used to I used to check back and think oh that was actually a really productive week you know I just needed to write it down to remember so yeah. that's a little bit of a tangent sorry for that <laughs> those are my tips no, I, I love that. I think we're all so guilty of that, of having all, all these many successes, big or small, mm -hmm. and, and then immediately moving on to, oh, but I haven't done this and this and this and that and the other thing, <laughs> with very little or no acknowledgement of the positive things that just happened. So mm -hmm. I, I really love that. Yeah. All right. Sev, any more tips? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they explained it beautifully. So I think, I think for me, the top tips that I can process, I can give is be mindful of your self-worth and be mindful of your capabilities and work towards those. It's okay if you don't have those kind of capabilities or skills that other people have. You're your own self and you have those self-worths that you can be proud of yourself. And if you work towards them as a goal, then you know in yourself that you're doing something positive to reach your own goal rather than competing with other people. I loved when Laura said, you know, speak to that, you know, that imposter syndrome, like speak back to it. But I think at the same time, it's, it's, I think it's kind of important to have, because it's, it kind of, it sometimes does one for me personally, it balances it out a little bit, because then I can see where the negatives are. And if I want to roll with those, that's up to me. But if I can see the negatives and the positives from that, and then build my way up to a more insightful, more brighter aspect, then I feel like, something has worked in that way and then I think for the second tip is just to it might sound weird but it's just to befriend yourself and befriend the person that you've become and how you've become this person is because of what you've done over the years and because of how you've achieved those certain goals so I think just befriend yourself and really reflect on those qualities that Kirsty mentioned as well is that write those little things down that make you smile and tell people about it and be open about your your positives and your negatives and hopefully those little voices will will simmer down eventually and you'll become this person that you've you've driven to become so yeah I think that's probably what I would say um if I wasn't <laughs> yeah that's amazing and I just, um, yeah, just add do. on one tiny yeah. little thing just yeah, I love that you said befriend the person you've become because like it is it is a it is transition and it is growth and it made me think of a feeling that I used to have that conservation was this all-encompassing thing that meant every aspect of ecology and environmentalism and every species and, and every technique and that you can't know it all and the feeling of needing to know it all to sort of reach out and grab the opportunities was really heavy mm -hmm. and so I sort of loved had to befriend the person I became and realize what I was interested in would mm -hmm. be what I would go after I would just have to do it that way other than try and spend my entire life trying to be perfect at everything. I would just have to pick something 
and see where it took me and that's when I the stumbling block kind of fell away was just trusting yeah, yeah. like you know what you like this thing so why mm. don't you just be that person instead of trying to study earthworms I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have like, you don't have to do that like somebody else out there has got that covered so yeah no I agree I agree that everyone is like a cog in the the bigger picture of conservation we all want the same thing so it's just looking at your strengths to then implement it into that that um that big goal where everyone's helping out definitely I mean when I first started I I had nothing I had no qualifications no experience I came from literally the very beginning and I think when I first started university I was like why am I here what am I doing here and luckily the community were extremely supportive and they gave me personal lessons one-to-one they took time out of their day to teach me all of these wonderful qualities of conservation so it it definitely does help when you have that community so I I really agree with Laura and Kirsty on that for sure yeah I you've captured so much good advice there that I just want to recommend remind everyone that we are recording this and you can go back and you can watch all of those tips again if you need them (laughs) because that was a lot of a lot of good insight and advice rapid fire that was amazing um okay so i want to ask again everyone who's here another question um as we go go a little bit further in the discussion so hopefully you can see the question there it's how often do you push yourself to do more than you can manage is it often? Is it sometimes? Is it never? And if it's never, I want to know your secrets. Um, so how often do you push yourself to do more than you can manage? <laughs> I can see that often is already in the lead. <laughs> <laughs> By far, <laughs> I'll just give another moment or two for everyone to, to jump in. Okay, I think we're there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's pretty, pretty overwhelming majority um, who often push themselves to do more than they can manage. I'll just leave that up as we go into the next question, which is how can perfectionism be a form of self-sabotage? What is good enough and how do you learn to say no? A lot going on in that question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kirsty, do you want to, do you want to start on that one? Start us off? Yeah, I made a couple of notes on this one because there's a a few things, few things I wanted to try and tie together. So instead of trying to memorize it, because I'm not a robot and I won't let (laughs) the syndrome get to me, I'm going to just read it to you. I'm going to be honest, I'm going to read some notes for it. (laughs) Um, yes. So I put down that in my opinion, a form of self-sabotage is perfectionism so putting things off until you are absolutely ready until you have absolutely all the qualifications and all the facts and all the knowledge and until it feels perfect to you but of course it never will be perfect because that concept doesn't exist and if you are waiting for perfect the opportunities will continue to pass you by and so on the notion of good enough so discounting perfectionism in favor of good enough and there is the concept of the good enough mother that you may be familiar with so it started around the 50s I think but also I was introduced to it um by watching a podcast by the school of life which is a great little platform if you've never used it they just have all kinds of life lessons on all different subjects and that's how I found out about being good enough and it really resonated with me so the good enough mother drops her need for for perfectionism to be the perfect mother and to cater for every single aspect of her child's knife life knife and instead tries to focus on the basic physical and emotional needs and thereby growing to good enough human beings that don't that aren't plagued by perfectionism because it is a destructive force in the end and sort of linked to this the quest for perfectionism is the need to say yes all the time and to get all the opportunities for your CV and to go to all the networking and to get your name out there. And in the process, I think I saw someone pop up in the chat is burnout and it will happen to you. But then linking back to the first poll when people were saying experience, the the lack of, I presume experience leads to imposter syndrome and self-sabotage. That's where you find the clash. Um, Trying to, trying to seek out these opportunities and leading to burnout. But, um, I would just say that you need to focus your own energy on prioritizing the opportunities and or maybe the gaps in your CV that really work for you because 
otherwise you're spending all that energy on someone else's project or someone else's research or someone else's charity and you're giving the energy away to them for sometimes little in return so volunteering will give you experience yes but the volunteering has to be in my opinion mutually beneficial and it's a whole big can of worms the volunteering in the conservation world mm -hmm. but if you are trying to say yes to everything to gain all of the experiences to be the perfect candidate that's a dangerous route mm -hmm. to go down so I think you need to find and choose the opportunity and you will find it easier if you say I want to experience something to do with I don't know reptiles and you go after that that's much better than just going on a whole bunch of forums and scrolling through a whole bunch of Instagram profiles saying yes to everything yeah we um, see that a lot from just a second now we see that a lot people sort of assuming that the next step is more volunteering more volunteering mm. more volunteering um you know until there's there's pages of cv work that of volunteering and sometimes you're already ready it's good enough you're exactly you are you are a good enough candidate as we all should be we are all good enough mm -hmm. and the, the the perfect person doesn't exist because the perfect person might be totally exhausted because they've burnt themselves out mm -hmm. and they might be they might have you know um a thin on the ground knowledge about absolutely everything and they're not they've not chosen to sort of be an expert in their field in one thing and that's actually what the role was looking for all along it's just a juggling act so you have to commit to and trust the concept of the good enough and just know that it is enough. Thanks so much, Kirsty. Did Seb or, or Laura, either of you want to say something else around that? I, I, I definitely agree with, with Kirsty for sure. I think the being the perfect person does not exist because there's, there's so much people can learn every single day. Like the learning only continues, it never stops. And I think that kind of aspect of learning will only kind of develop you as a person not to be perfect but I feel like sometimes if you're striving for perfection you're fueling this persona of yourself that doesn't exist and I think when you when you waste so much energy on this on this person you want to be you really deprive yourself of all the things that you want to be if that makes sense and I think when you when you try and it's it's a difficult one you know because it you want to be perfect but there's just there's nothing that can come close to that and you know like Kirsty said you will fall and, and it will drain you for example I I run my own podcast is it's literally just me on my own but I want it to be perfect and I can't I can't get it to that level that I want it to be so for me to kind of have this natural this natural environment for myself is to make it as calming as possible for myself as well so then the audience understand or can feel that kind of calmness that's coming from me instead of it has to be scripted exactly how I want it to be because you don't get that same reaction you don't get that same awareness and the inspiration kind of does die out a little bit and in terms of good enough everyone is good enough everyone is definitely good enough you it took me a long time to actually figure that out about myself but I've definitely learned and I am I am definitely good enough in what I do and I'm passionate about what I do and I can if I can inspire people on the way then I know that I am good enough to do that I don't need to be the perfect candidate for example if you have a perfect CV and this and you send it into somebody or into a company but then another person who has a different kind of experience that has been to Brazil or has done something within Spain or in America. It's those little things that kind of interest the, you know, the company itself, because you have a different type of regional experience that you've been somewhere else and you've gained that perspective of other people. So I think, I think everyone, everyone is good enough in their own way and you don't need to strive and drain yourself to be this person that you aren't comfortable with the ability to say no that's a tricky one because I can't say no <laughs> so, um but I remember when I first said no to something that I really didn't want to do and I was like oh my gosh this is going to stop me from doing everything and then my boss was like okay I was like what? yeah yeah it's like we've just got to give ourselves a little bit of a break mm -hmm. and I think sometimes perfectionism and success are on the same 
people yeah. put them together but it's kind of redefining what your description or perception of success is mm. um for me success would be um doing a few things that I like doing having enough free time maybe not getting like up here which it used to be like <laughs> be like I don't know having a lot more free time mm. is actually my um vision of success <laughs> yeah no I, I yeah. completely agree with that and also something that I'm going through at the minute is um the the success or the the sweet part is the journey not the not mm. the end goal is it wasn't graduating it mm. was it was staying up mm. late into the night and blood sweat and tears or the success isn't actually getting mm. the job it's what came before and everything that's going to come after so it's like reaching those high points or when we do live in a kind of social media world where people post especially on linkedin there's a lot of you know I've just done this and I've just done that mm. and here's my certificate for this and that's that's a tiny part of the journey the journey mm. is everything else in between those are the successes and mm. I've been so guilty of of ticking a box and moving on to the next one and it's it's not healthy and it's not going to be sustainable so I'm just trying to enjoy every little aspect instead of that, the that was definitely my that was definitely my life growing up it was all about ticking a box in in, a, in an aspect for my family in Turkey it was very much oh I have to go to university and and I have to graduate with the best grades I mean of course I have to I have to I have to be this person that my capabilities don't reach and it was very very hard to kind of tell my family in Turkey that I didn't get a distinction <laughs> um I got you know it was all it's all those little tiny things that come from a very cultured background where you think okay so I have to be perfect and I have to be the, the the perfect child I have to be because otherwise there's nothing less I can't be less and I think having that journey where I've, I've spoken to people and friends who I adore have really and even family members such as my brother who have been an absolute inspiration and telling me to just calm down and mm. you can say no it's okay no one's going to say anything otherwise and guilt will not, you know, it won't come into the conversation because, you know, if I say no, I'd feel guilty immediately for saying no, but then I wasn't really focusing on what I wanted on the possibilities that I could do. So it, it definitely does take time. And if you find something that you're really passionate about, then I would I'd definitely go for it because there's nothing stopping you at all. I hesitate to even say anything after that because I love that message. <laughs> yeah, I I think we we often assume that saying no is always a negative. You know, it's always a loss. Um, it's always a bad thing. And in fact, it, it can actually be a, a real positive because it can create space for other things and more focus on on the things that really matter. Um, so I I think it can be. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing to say no. Really positive. Um, okay, so I want to ask our, our audience here one last question. Um, and then we'll just have a little bit more discussion. We'll open up for Q&A. So the last question is, how often do you struggle to balance your career and your personal life? Um, often, sometimes, never. How often do you, just, do you struggle to balance your career with your personal life? Um, you know, and personal life might be personal projects, um, uh, things you need to do. It might be family. You know, it might be different for everybody. No nevers. So, for, oh, one never. Okay. I'm curious again about your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, please tell us. <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. So I'll just share the results here. Um, so yeah, as you can see, mm -hmm. most most people are, are choosing often or you know, sometimes, and it looks like one person one person's got it to an art. <laughs> yeah. I like the um, comment from below. The secret is working from home. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> well, many are doing that now. I love it. <laughs> so I have I have one last question for the three of you from me, which is given that in, 
and this is a big generalization um, and it might be true in some parts of the world and less so in, in others, but with generally increasing choices and opportunities for women, how can women do it all or have it all, you know, the career and the personal life and personal projects, et cetera. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I would say, try not to think that you need everything. Mm -hmm. So instead of being like, I need to have it all, just being like, if I have it all, great. If I don't, then that's okay too. So kind of twisting that that question to yourself, maybe. Mm. Um, also looking at things as could your passions and your personal projects become part of your career, which is kind of what I'm trying to do with my artwork. Um, and then is there something that gives you a kind of, you can still make a bit of money on the side and um, it's not as kind of hectic um, to keep you going. So maybe looking at more of a balance between a passion becoming a part of your work, but it doesn't become too much of your work that it's removed as a passion. Because <laughs> um, with my artwork, sometimes I think I'd love to do it full time, but then as a creative, it's, it's not always there. It's not that creativity isn't there. And I'll sit down at my desk and I'll think, I can't draw this animal. <laughs> but <laughs> I do have belief in myself that at some point I will and I'll get it. Um, but I do think that is because I have another job that's completely separate. It, I'm working in a coffee shop and I love coffee. Um, so it's marrying the two together. And that's how I, um, balance it out um and also I was quite I think I saw someone just put it on maybe on the chat that I was quite honest when I went into my current roles what I could do on what I could um uh what I could give to each employer mm. so I wasn't like yes I can do everything which I used to do when I was younger to get that experience whereas now being a bit more confident in my ability I say I can do this and I can do this and then give myself enough time for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on that little bit. Um, but yeah, being more honest with what you can actually, what you can actually give to each. And I found it really positive that both employees have said, that's great. I know what you need, you can commit to. Um, so instead of going in and being like, yeah, I can do everything. And then having to say, oh no, sorry, I can't, no, I can't. Which is fine, you can say no, like we were saying. <laughs> But if you've already set that bar, I would mm -hmm. say that's quite a good way to manage manage everything. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that for sure. For it's not always a nine to five, you know, and it's you always have that opportunity to build something on the side, just like Laura and and Kirsty and myself. It's it's nice to have those kind of opportunities to build something, even though you know, one day it will become something, you know, someone will kind of show interest in what you do and reach out to you for advice or for some tips. And, you know, even though I do do this current do what I'm doing currently, I love my podcast. I love insp inspiring generations to be more curious about the outdoors. And if I can juggle that with what I'm doing now, and then for personal projects as well I want to try and make I want to try and make a documentary for myself and researching all those little things to really make it this kind of documentary where people will relate to what I'm trying to create and I think to have it all to me personally sounds a bit boring I, I'd like to kind of I'd, I'd love to work on my my capabilities and my self-worth and then understand where I can go and it and it comes back to success my success isn't high you know to inspire people to develop my own curiosities to develop my experiences that's my that's my success and if it is stages of success then I'm happy to go all the way on that so I think I think to have it all is in anyone's mind it, it, if you want to have it all go for it you know your own you know you're your power person you can do what you want but I think personally for me I think I'd, I'd love to build my way up to the successes that I always kind of dreamed of having um so 
yeah, I mean, have personal projects, reach out to people. I think that's the best thing that I've done is reach out to people because they always have an interest in what you do. And one day, maybe tomorrow in the next hour, someone will notice what you're doing and really kind of give you that recognition that you really need in life. So yeah, work towards what you want because it's probably the best thing that I've ever done. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add. It was just another kind of lesson and something I'm working on on that of external validation and mm. just trying to come and needing to come at things from a place of self rather than external because I was, it was bad for seeking validation consciously mm. and unconsciously and, uh, and in that probably quest to have it all or be seen to have it all and then um, it's you, just, you have to concentrate inwards and also that your career necessarily doesn't equal your um worth as, as a conservationist or equal your interest passion or love for conservation you can influence it in many different ways and that might be through a side project or just you being you you don't have to kind of work in the fields and you are allowed to change your mind and you don't have to stay in your lane and if you do take a break just trust that like the bus will always come around and pick you back up again and you jump on a, a new stop maybe that just looks a little bit different but it's going to work out for you and mm -hmm. yeah I've just been learning there's room to move not mm -hmm. everything's as prescriptive as you think it is you can move around it's your life and not necessarily I don't mean that from a point of like yeah everybody's free to just take a couple of paths and see what happens obviously life is hard and there are bills to pay and we do have families we do have commitments but in your own way of being there is room to move and to be you and you can change your mind mm -hmm. <clears throat> so much I just want to say to you there's some great comments here in the in the chat and some some experiences and advice other people have shared thanks carly and myra um, and julia etc for that so i think now is a great moment to to open it up for q a um we've got a couple questions so far so the first question is um and again just if you have a question um pop it into the q a rather than the chat please um, so the first question is from Rachel and it's Kirsty, did you find it difficult to be accepted on a master's course that was so different to your bachelor's? I'm an English graduate and I'm considering a conservation master's, but many seem to want a science degree. Man, I could talk to you about this all day long. <laughs> I'll try and keep it brief. Um, one thing, oh, I will keep it brief, but one thing also, um, there was a great thing that I done but think long and hard about why you want to or why you think you might need to do a master's if it is to get a job that's not necessarily always the case and um, my course was great it was a lot of hard work and I sometimes potentially think I could have gone just fine without it so it is a question to, to bear in mind and if you do want to chat I'm happy to you can I'm sure you share contact details um, but yes I found it quite challenging although English is a great background it was a great skill because there's a lot of writing involved and once you learn the technique of scientific writing just having a wordy background is helpful you probably find it e you find it easy to write into a moat and to put forward all the different projects that you need to do in a master so it definitely helped in that respect it was just switching that mindset a little bit from creative into slightly more a, a scientific way of writing and thinking but it was a big crash course there was a lot to learn um and 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 on the application just to get into the course there's a lot of transferable skills that you have so you can replace the need for a scientific undergrad with a whole bunch of stuff that you've got that makes you unique and made me unique and got me onto the course because sometimes having a, a, a big bunch of sheep who've just done this and then they're doing a, do this is just turning out the same type of mentality sometimes no offense to anyone that did do that but you are coming at it from this angle so you potentially makes you the standout candidate right from the start. Something I would add to that is also maybe have a look at different jobs that are using your skill set already. So like Kirsty said, really think about if you want to do the masters and if you do, that's absolutely amazing. But you might be able to use the skill set you have and the job you're already doing um, and use that to go into the conservation sector, but in a slightly different way than maybe you'd thought about before. So um, if it's yeah, English, then 
maybe journalism looking to that and then going into um more again getting confused what i'm trying to say basically look, look at the the skill set you have and see if there's jobs that would allow you to go into that into the conservation sector because the conservation sector is so broad like Kirsty said it's not just mm. this one little tiny thing um definitely explore different job opportunities um you could even google really really simply like english um conservation jobs like really basic i know that sounds really stupid but you never know what's going to come up mm. i i find the combination is really good to have and especially uh, sort of English or journalism background is great and to if experiences ever comes up as a problem I find reach, reaching out to write for different nature conservation publications was a good way to show experience because it was something I could already do then you start to marry the two together so that's quite a good angle as well Thanks everyone, sorry I was on mute. <laughs> um, I just shared a link in the chat to you about, uh, it's an ultimate guide we have about if you're considering a master's degree, which kind of echoes, I think, some of the things you guys have just said. Um, mm. or considering if it's if it's actually going to get you where you want to go or not. Mm. Um, but sometimes there's lots of other great ways to get there. Mm. I agree uh, for, for Rachel as well. I, I knew a friend who had an English degree and she did a master's in conservation science documentary documentary and that really played a huge part she had a very good positive benefit from that because she knew how to write storylines and connect audiences with characters or individuals of species so she knew how to kind of use her english skills to actually build a story and write a story from scratch so i think i think you have a beautiful quality in yourself that you can use and to go into a science degree it's brilliant. It's brilliant because then you can you can use that English degree and the science degree as well to really combine the two together to make it more sim simplified science. You know, majority of the public do find it quite difficult to understand the science, but if you have both of those qualities together, you have the advantage to kind of really simplify those to people to get people interested in wildlife and in nature. So definitely, definitely go for it. Great. Thanks for the question, Rachel. <laughs> That's great. So next question is from Claire. Uh, have any of the panelists come across people actively trying to derail them from working in conservation, apart from Kirsty's course example earlier? Ooh. Good question, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> or a tough question, me. Um, yeah, I've had an experience with it. Um, I was already working in the conservation sector and I went for a promotion and um, the person I was up against who didn't get the promotion and I, I was successful, um, decided that he would make my life very hard in that role. Um, mm. So yeah, it was, an, it was an interesting experience, but I think it made me stronger Mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily you have to have that kind of experience to believe in yourself but um yeah it was it was interesting and it was almost like derailing me in in the promotion rather than the conservation sector but yeah there are people out there who don't want you to succeed we're not saying that everyone is supportive most people are but then if you've got that self-belief um that you know that you're doing what you believe in and what you want to do then mm -hmm. that that's very powerful yeah, I definitely agree. I've had I've definitely had a circumstance where someone has actively tried to uh, derail me in insult me in any way possible to try and up anything uh, to try and be better than me. And it just kind of it doesn't affect me in any way. It just shows me what kind of person that individual is and a person that I don't really necessarily want to work with in future. So I think it's just reflecting on the situation if if that's happened with, with anybody I think it's just reflecting taking taking it all in and learning from that circumstance and understanding that your place is where it is because of what you love to do so having someone try to derail you is very it's quite low on the other individual but if you have that inner strength and that in you know that ability to be inspired about what you do 
then that really shouldn't matter. It's almost like a little tiny voice in your head that is only just trying to make it harder for you. So <laughs> what was interesting for me as well was that um, if that individual wasn't so um, mean or whatever, I probably would have asked more from him as an, like a, an opinion or got him involved. But because of that, that behavior, it really, it just put me off not wanting to work with that individual. So it goes back to maybe the fact that Kirsten and I've had similar experiences, that that's why we're so, I don't know, we're so behind the idea of supporting each other, just mm -hmm. helping each other out and supporting the people who do get those prom promotions above you, because they also might need assistance and therefore that will give you mm -hmm. an opportunity in a different way. Um, yeah. yeah and I just wanted to echo that when I first started kind of working in a few different jobs and I was fit myself forward to be on the steering group and set as a young trustee or a young member of a board and being put into really scary situations ultimately um, with a lot more mature people than me predominantly um, men not always um, and just being totally shut out of the conversation mm -hmm. um, to, to that level of like invisibility as in that sort of like oh did you hear someone speak type of type of thing not that out loud that kind of thing just being totally just being about this small in a room and just coming back again thinking right I need to reassess this and how am I going to get my point across and how am I going to have my voice heard because there's a completely new atmosphere for me to be in and I've found certain aspects of conservation to be that kind of clicky sort of speak speak loud and speak fast right now forever hold your peace to get your point across especially in a room full of competing voices um and just needing to find my own way so no one trying to derail me but nobody you know making the effort to make me be heard in any way so i realized right i'm gonna have to be heard for myself here no one's gonna say and what do you think they're mm -hmm. just gonna completely ignore me <laughs> yeah I, I definitely agree with that i think you make your own luck yeah. And that is different to every individual. So I think the most important thing is to really stay focused on what you love doing and, and create that look that you that you strive for. And it doesn't have to be reassured by anybody. You know, it doesn't have to be from anyone else. It has to be from yourself. So mm -hmm. definitely stick to what you love, what you love doing. And, and if anyone tries to do it, then you stick to what you have strived for. I love what Tori just said in the chat as well about being in those situations where women can amplify other women's ideas instead of men repeating it like they were their own. And it just happened. That's not trying to stereotype, but yeah, I've seen that happen. I love that idea. And that's all, that's what and another thing is. It's just this mm -hmm. supportive community where we, we're championing each other instead of being the competition. Exactly. Thanks so much. For this. I, there, we had a question from Ellie that I've just typed in an answer for you, Ellie, that I hope will help. Your question was around, you know, how much experience you need to get into conservation. And it, it really depends on where you want to be in conservation. It can vary a lot um, depending where you're coming from and where you want to be. So I sent you a video series that's free that you can watch and I think will help you answer that. Um, I hope that helps. Um, Ashley, great question, but I'm afraid we're, we're over time. So I'm going to have to stop here, um, but I will share contacts. Um, you're welcome to, to reach out to, to any of us. Um, I think if you want to, if you want an answer to that one um, about the scariest situation you've been in. Um, and I just want to, I just want to say an enormous thank you to, to all three of you for joining as guests today, Kirsty, Laura, and Seb. It's been amazing having you guys here. There's so much more to say, <laughs> which is basically the theme of and another thing. <laughs> There's more. You have, um, to stop me. you have to stop me. I'll stop. I'll just won't, <laughs> I won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe we'll do this again next year. Who knows? Um, maybe we'll have a follow-on discussion. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here, for sharing, you know, your insights and your personal stories uh, and your experiences. And I just, just to finish off, do you guys have any resources, sort of top resources you'd like to point people to and or um, places people can get in touch with you if they want to know more about what you do? I think I pop my Instagram, which is the best, my own personal one, which is Wild Scott Place. And I, I love a chat. 
so do just message me like let's just get down to it I just I love skipping small talk and just being like what's the yeah what's the worst thing that ever happened to you tell me about it I just I love a chat so yeah I'm happy to talk and then please join Laura and I on and another thing um soon we should we have things called big chats and they're just a, they're just a big chat a space to get honest to ask for advice networking to reach out to make connections and the next one should be in april you can get that on our website we'd love to see you there yes and if anyone wants to reach out to me you can find me on my podcast which is be curious beans podcast on instagram and uh, i will ask kirsty to share my email as well if anyone has any questions um i would be very happy to help you with perfect i'm just popping my instagram into good old instagram (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) Uh, laura.coppageart if you would like to check that out but um yeah you can find me on and another place on instagram as well just to say it is confusing so the instagram is called and another place but the platform's called and another thing you know how (laughs) the the name has been taken (laughs) that happens well thanks so so much so We've recorded this. We're going to share the recording with everyone. We'll share a whole list of resources um, as well together with that, that you can go on and, and read more um, about women in conservation. Um, so hopefully that's that's useful. And yeah, thanks to everyone who joins today for being part of the, the conversation. I hope that this is, you know, it's the beginning and it sparks other conversations and insights um, as well. Uh, here at Conservation Careers, we work, run a website uh, every month. Uh, we've got uh, webinars lined up until June, and some of the topics are how to use evidence when you're applying for jobs, um, how to switch careers into conservation, which we touched on a bit today. Uh, more and more people are switching in, so hopefully that'll be useful. And also LinkedIn for conservationists, which we've realized is quite a hot topic for a lot of people. Uh, so those are just some of the ones we have coming up. We'll be sharing information about those by email on our website, but you can also just go to our website, conservation-careers.com, and it's under advice and webinars. Um, so to stay tuned for those. And thanks again, everyone. Um, we'll, we'll hope to see you on future webinars and other live events um, and keep the conversation going. And until then, take care. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye.